Hey everybody, good morning. Here's a slightly longer problem for this week. Imagine a thin bar of uniform density that has a tiny glued on ball located near both ends. And in the center of the bar is a frictionless axle that allows the bar to rotate freely. Initially, everything is perfectly balanced and nothing is moving. But at some point, the ball on the right will become loose and fall off, which causes the bar and the other remaining ball to rotate, kind of like this. That is all the information that we are provided. And here's what the problem wants us to do. In part A, we need to solve for the angular acceleration of the bar at the exact moment that the rotation starts. Then in part B, determine if that angular acceleration remains constant. If it doesn't, we need to describe how it changes. And finally, in part C, we're going to solve for the angular velocity of the bar once it rotates into a vertical position. Before we start with part A, we should probably set up a free body diagram first. I'll center a coordinate system right on the axle of the bar and indicate which rotational direction I'm considering positive in the upper right hand corner. Since there's no friction, we only need to label two forces, the weight of the bar and the weight of the ball. The weight of the bar won't cause any rotation since the line of action for that force goes directly through the origin, where the rotational axis is located. The weight of the ball, however, does cause a rotation, and the lever arm corresponding to that force will be this distance here in the blue. There's one more thing that we should do here before moving on. Let's try and find a way to define this lever arm in terms of a quantity that we know. Here's how we can do that. I'll refer to the entire length of the bar as capital L, or just L for short. Measured from the center of the bar, where x is equal to zero, half of the bar sticks out in the positive direction and the other half in the negative direction. Notice that the negative length in red is the same length as the lever arm above it. Thus, we can say that the lever arm is equal to negative L divided by two. And with that known, we now have everything that we need to get started. So let's move on to the sum of torques equation next. We saw in the picture that only one force had an influence on rotation. Therefore, the sum of torques on the left-hand side will only contain a single term. We also need to include the moment of inertia of both objects on the right. So here's how we do that. Let's plug in our definition of torque on the left and apply what we know so far. F is the weight of the ball, which is minus mg in this coordinate system. The lever arm is negative L over two, and the angle between F and the lever arm is 90 degrees. And since the sine of 90 degrees just simplifies to one, we can just drop that piece and continue with the rest of the expression on the left-hand side, like this. Here we can see that the negative signs will end up canceling each other out, which results in a torque that's positive. To isolate the angular acceleration, let's divide both sides by the moment of inertia of both objects, and then try to figure out what kind of expressions we should put down there. The problem is that we don't exactly know what the moment of inertia is, for rotation through the center of a bar. But 
we do have an expression that's pretty close if we end up approximating the bar as a rod instead. As for the ball, the only detail we were provided is that it's very small. So what might help is if we treat it as a particle, because there's no given radius for that object. Here, capital R in the moment of inertia of a particle expression is defined as the distance between the particle and the axis of rotation. So let's replace capital R with negative L divided by 2. Therefore, the variable I both in the denominator of the bottom equation on this slide is going to look like the following sum. And when we plug in the expressions from this reminder box here on the left, here's what we get. We should start by squaring negative L over 2 in the denominator. Next, I'll factor the L squared quantity out of both terms inside the parentheses, since we can do some canceling with that. One factor of L upstairs will eliminate one factor downstairs, and so our expression will look like this after we get rid of those. The next thing I'd like to do is to make this thing a little bit more compact. If we take our mass terms in the denominator and we move them into the numerator of the fraction coefficients that they touch, well, it looks a lot nicer. Following that, let's distribute the two coefficient in the denominator into the parentheses. We'll get 2 over 12, which simplifies to 1 over 6, and 2 over 4, which simplifies to 1 half. From here, I'm going to factor out the ratio of g divided by l. The other ratio containing the masses doesn't look very nice at the moment, since we have a sum of unlike fractions buried inside the denominator of another fraction. The whole thing is just kind of a mess. To fix it, let's multiply the mass of the ball divided by 2 by a special form of 1. This will create a common denominator of 6, so instead of summing two different fractions, we can just use a single fraction instead. The denominator of the denominator can be rearranged into the numerator, and I'll even move that 6 into the g over l ratio, like this. Now what we have here looks way better than before. There's no further simplification required, so let's go ahead and start plugging in some numbers. And here it's easy to see that the meters units cancel out in the first ratio, and the kilograms units cancel out in the second. Therefore, the value of our angular acceleration right as the rotation starts is approximately 16.3 radians per second squared. And that's our answer to part A. For part B, let's take a look at our picture again and focus on the force and the lever arm of our torque. During the rotation, the lever arm will become smaller and smaller until eventually it just becomes zero once the bar is in a vertical position. Now in case you're wondering why it becomes zero here, remember that we're approximating this bar as a thin rod. And I emphasize thin because that means we can squeeze it as thin as we like, even infinitely thin. We're also approximating the ball as a particle, and that implies that it doesn't even have a size. It's like an infinitely small dot. So you can picture this 
as gluing something infinitely small onto something else that we're squeezing infinitely thin. So using these approximations, a more accurate picture might look something kind of like this, where the force of the weight of the ball will line up exactly with the axis of rotation, resulting in a lever arm length of zero. And this is important because if the lever arm gets smaller, then the angular acceleration has to shrink as well. It can't remain constant. And that's all we really need to demonstrate for the answer to part B. For the last part, we need to use energy conservation. And I think it'll help if I restore the picture back to normal so everything is easier to see. Let's say that right before the motion starts, the bar and the ball are in the initial position. And then once they swing through the vertical, that will be our final position. In the final position, I'll set the Y value of the ball to zero, which means the initial Y value will be L over two, which is halfway up from the bottom of the bar. And now we can properly represent the potential energy of the ball in the energy conservation equation. Let's start by throwing away this other work term since there's no friction and I'm going to continue the habit of rewriting our kinetic energy terms to account for translational and rotational motion, like this. On the initial side, nothing is moving yet, so the kinetic energy terms over on that side are just equal to zero. On the final side, the translational kinetic energy term can be removed as well, since there's no straight line motion occurring here. It's all rotation. Also, since we set the Y value of the ball to zero in the final position, that means we can set the final potential energy here to zero as well. So we've whittled this expression down to just a single term on both sides. But be careful here, because the potential energy term on the left applies to just the ball, whereas the rotational kinetic energy term over on the other side applies to both. Let's clean this slide up and take a closer look at what's going on here. We can exchange the potential energy term of the ball with mg y initial and the rotational kinetic energy term with one half i omega squared. If we replace y initial with L over two, notice that we end up with a two in the denominator on both sides, which can be eliminated. Let's clean this up and then divide both sides by the moment of inertia term next and we'll plug in the same sum that we used from earlier. I'll do the exact same approach and start by squaring the negative L over two term in the denominator and then pull L squared out front. And just like before, we can divide out a single factor of L upstairs and downstairs. Next, I'll make the expression compact again by moving the mass terms in the denominator into the numerator of the fraction coefficients that they're touching. Following that, we'll factor out g over l and then multiply the mass of the ball divided by four by a special form of one. And this way, we can write everything downstairs using a common denominator of 12 and then apply a single ratio to represent that sum. The denominator of the denominator will get pushed up into the numerator 
and then I'll move that 12 to the g over l ratio. And all that's left is to take the square root of both sides and then plug in our numbers. When I put this all into my calculator, I get a final answer of approximately 5.70 radians per second for the angular velocity. And that's our answer for part C. In case you'd like a recap of everything that we did, here's an outline of our answers for each part here on the solution card. That's all for today, folks. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.